Hey, this is Mike Lindsay from Vital MX. I'm lucky enough to actually have uh, two different people to speak with today on the large breaking news we have that, in my opinion, is uh, one of the biggest things that hit the sport. I'd say the last decade, but I think we can add a couple decades to that even. Uh, we have Dave Prater from Feld Motorsports. We also have Kerry Joe Russell slash Coombs um, from MX Sports. And we're talking about the combined efforts that you guys post out this morning. So um, I know from my, my own position personally, before coming back to media, kind of doing the team thing for a little bit, that during um, kind of the COVID pandemic, I would feel like a lot of things accelerated between you guys. But it sounds like even, you know, a little bit before that, um, we maybe finally found some some common ground. I know not really in maybe your guys's tenures, um, but maybe with some prior interactions, prior people, there's been, I want to say a war between Supercross and Motocross, but it's never been as friendly as it is now. Um, I guess before we get into today's announcement, what kind of led to the path here that um, has you guys working hand in hand? It was, uh, it's been a long path. So um, long story, I'll try to keep it short, but um, so in, 2020 and you kind of touched on it michael like there's been this perception um that we've been at war we've been at odds with one another and it's that was never good for anyone so um in 2020 um myself and todd jindro went over to daytona and met with carrie and davy um and really just wanted to squash that um once and for all and for lack of a better term bury the hatches so um we met and we said, look, this is not good for anyone. It's not good for the industry that there's this perception out there that we, we don't get along um, and we don't work together. We, we, we're in a unique spot because all of our athletes race with both championships. All of our athletes race Supercross, all of our athletes race Motocross. Um, and the fact that we never really work together um, just, I think, bothered all of us. So we left that meeting in Daytona, really not knowing what the future hold held, but we um, we were optimistic on you know something forming, whether that was just some something as simple as promoting each other at the live event, trying to help each other sell tickets, or something bigger. So um, I think you know we all left left that meeting in Daytona. We were optimistic, but then um, fast forward a week, and Indy Supercross was that next weekend. And unfortunately, um, COVID obviously shut us down. We had to cancel Indy Supercross. And um, Carrie and her team formed the Safe to Race Task Force. And from there, this relationship really just snowballed. Um, so that's really, that's what the, you know, the seed that planted all of this um, was at that meeting in Daytona. But COVID, if there was a positive that came out of COVID for me and for us as our two organizations, um, it was really the cooperation and, and the friendship that, that started between both companies. Stepping past that, I, I'm sure with the news coming out today, a lot of people want to look at it as a reactionary cause um, to World Supercross without being too disrespectful to that group, though. My opinion from my side of the fence and knowing kind of what I know is I would argue that their existence is more because of what you guys were doing. Of course, Feld had um, decided not to renew their contract with the FIM, um, which has allowed you guys to work more closely with AMA Pro Racing and in turn MX Sports. Would that be accurate in saying, like, again, people think this is reactionary, but you guys have been working on this from what I'm aware longer than that has been announced. Yeah, this is in no way reactionary. Um, we're, we're working together. Our focus is to grow the sport of supercross, grow the sport of motocross, and now grow super motocross in the world championship. So that's really been it. And, um, you know, like I said, it's been, it's been in the works for two years, two plus years. Yeah, if you're looking for, you know, a timeline, um, after Dave and Todd came to Daytona and said, let's, you know, bury the hatchet, this is not good, you know, for, for either series. Um, and then uh, COVID hit. And after we put the Safe to Race Task Force together, they came to us and said, you know, we need to finish our season, which means motocross would have to shift. Uh, Supercross is very important uh, to, to both series, to the teams. And we said, absolutely. Uh, we moved not once, but 
I think maybe three times we, we shifted our schedules. And, and then the next year in the spring of 2021, uh, our, our contract with NBC, our television broadcast contract was gonna expire at the end of that year. And uh, I knew that their contract with NBC expired the next year. This was the first time our, our broadcast contracts uh, were gonna expire that close together. So it was now or never to align ourselves to go to market together. And if we we're honest with ourselves, Motocross is a relatively short season for a professional sport. It's three and a half months. And Supercross is two. They're four and a half months. And so uh, we don't have that long professional sport season that, that other sports do. So by combining our seasons, we have something meaningful, something that uh, looks and feels like other professional sports. So that's why we decided, let's go to market together on our broadcast schedule. And that was back in uh, early 2021. So this has been in the works ever since then. So just to touch on a little bit is, I'm sure for the fans that still were confused by some of the TV and streaming options this year, part of kind of what's gone this year has been you guys sort of going through this place holding situation for a year because of, again, it's been, I imagine as you guys are putting this together, it's hard to be able to tell everybody, hey, we have a big plan down the road. Um, but all in all, this shows a lot more light that other than this series that's being announced, a big focus for you guys is to have a combined presence, a message, um, being able to get the best package for the viewers in terms of TV deal, um, in terms of streaming, instead of everybody having to jump around to be able to finally lock this all together into, into one deal. Absolutely. Um, our, we have had challenges with our streaming this year, um, but we, we've met those and uh, Mav's been a great partner for us and we hope to continue a relationship with them. But this particular uh, project started uh, back a year ago. Right. And it really started with the media rights. So like Carrie said, she, she came to us and said, look, my media rights are up this year. Yours are up in a year. What if we go to market together? Um, and really that's, that was the second part of this that started to fall in line. And we work with IMG. They sell our media rights. We bundled the media rights together, but along the way, we ask companies, media companies, what do what do you want to see? What does the fans want to What do the fans want to see? And really, across the board, the answer was the same. They're like, the modern sports fan has come to expect a postseason playoff system and a Super Bowl or a World Series or something to crown the end of the season. And currently, yeah, you guys can combine your two championships, but you don't have that. And that was really what, you know, led us to develop what you, uh, what you saw announced today. We also both did, we did a survey uh, last summer, if you probably don't recall. <laughs> no, I, I did see it. Yeah, I got okay. it. Okay. And that was our doing our due diligence, doing our research, you know, and asking our fans what they thought about you know, the, the two separate series working together and, and the answer was the same. Yeah. So for you guys talking about a playoff system, um, I know from just some of the OEM reps I talked to, I know you guys have, as was released in the press uh, release today, you guys had comments from pretty much the major racing representative of, of major OEM and one or two of those I've spoken to personally. I know a as the landscape of our, our sport is changing a little bit right now, I know all the OEMs are very behind domestic series because they are domestic entities, whether we're talking about American Honda, the Kawasaki Motor Corporation, any of these we name off, you know, they're an American um, entity of them. They want to race here. They want to show the product here. They want to support the sport here. Um, so with that, at the same time, they are all mentioned that, you know, we, we have a lot of racing, a lot of riders comment about it, a lot of teams like, hey, we're already getting towards the max of what we think we can pull off. So as this playoff series comes into it, how big of a challenge has that been for you guys? And as I know the schedules haven't been announced, but is it likely there will be some concessions on your guys' each individual series to keep 
the schedule not growing too much more than it already is in total races. Yeah, so we um, currently, the season next year will be 17 Supercrosses, 11 motocross races, two playoffs, and the World Championship. So that's 31. Um, traditionally, we've done 30. So when we did the U.S. Open and the Monster Energy Cup, we were at 30. <laughs> so we're going to keep it at 31. Heading, um, looking towards the future, I'm sure we'll have to see how all this plays out. Um, do you guys expect it to stay somewhat statically like that or depending on how the playoff series is, um, the reception of it, um, if that were to grow, would it require further concessions from each series uh, from what you guys have kind of talked to you about again between the riders and the OEMs? Could the series grow much more than that 31? Do you think there's room to do it? Or do you think that is the goal is to probably stay inside that number? Tough to yeah. see. You know, we, we need to get one under our belt mm -hmm. and reassess it. But I think, yeah, 100%. I think we're going to learn a lot as we go through this. But the goal is to maintain that 30-31 race championship. Um, it, we, we want, obviously, the OEMs, um, their feedback and feedback that they've given us is that that, that is what they would desire. Um, you know, you get, you get those three months of off season to prep for the upcoming season as well. So that's our goal. But like Carrie said, this is going to develop and no one really knows where it's going to go, but uh, we're just excited about seeing it through. Now, a general, you know, you're very core fan that is maybe a little bit more on the motocross side, more of the history side of it. Destinations is very important. Luckily this year with it being back in the U S there's definitely some renewed interest in it, rider interest. Um, how much conversation is there with you guys with kind of the third the, the third elephant in the room in front with the ability to keep the schedule to a position where motocross of nations is um, capable for these riders. Is that in your guys' forefront mind? Has that discussion happened? It absolutely has happened. We work very well with in front, um, very well with, with David Luongo. We reached out to him and told him the plan. And uh, he actually um, was very positive about it. He, basically moved his schedule up to accommodate um, the American motocross schedule so that their race would be close to the end of our season. What that um, caused was he was having to have GPs after the motocross of nations, which is not ideal. By us using the month of September for super motocross, he can then move his, his race back into its traditional mid-October and so he could finish up his GP schedule and he, he was very supportive of our of our schedule and our timing and it does not um, adversely impact the motocross of nations at all. So the goal would basically be in, in terms of timeline your traditional AMA Monster Energy Supercross series your Lucas Oil AMA Pro Motocross series the new Super Motocross world champion playoff and championship race, and then finally ending with a destination each year. Yes. Yep. So one of the big tag headlines, or one of the big parts of the headline is the purse. Um, guys announced that it will be $10 million um, added, but I'm sure a lot of people are asking at this point is, where does where is that applicable? Is that applicable across everything? Is that for the playoff into the world championship at the end? You know, money talks. Where Where is it going to be at? So we're still working out the overall details of exactly how it's going to be distributed, but just know that Supercross will get a lift, Motocross will get a lift, and then obviously Super Motocross is new, but there'll be a large portion of it for the Super Motocross Championship, as well as those three, the playoff rounds and the World Championship. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit across the board. Yeah. Nice. Um, you know, we have a, a slew of riders. Um, it it kind of seems to always go in waves. We've had some some big names go to Supercross only contracts later in the careers, and then it kind of went away. We definitely have a little bit of a wave of it starting again right now. Um, so qualifying for this series, you guys announced that it would be the top 22 um, from 450 and 250 based on combined points that would race this series. Um, let's just take an example. Let's say, you know, Eli Tomac next year is planning on as of right now, racing Supercross only is what they announced. Let's say he defends his title, finishes top two somewhere in that range, what we know he's capable of. Um, with the current point structure you guys are looking at, will a rider be able to qualify for the playoffs 
and the world championship just based, do you think they'll be able to pull it off on Supercross only, or will this promote people and riders to participate all year? Do you think you'll need points realistically from both championships to be able to make it in? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. So we're still, again, everything's fluid and we're still working through it. But um, Carrie and I both feel like you don't necessarily have to race. So motocross only guy who scores enough to be in the top 22 would still be eligible for the playoffs and vice versa. Um, obviously puts them into a disadvantage moving into the playoffs for the overall super motocross championship. But um, there'll be instances, I think, where that happens, unfortunately, due to injury. Someone's injured during the Supercross season or the, the motocross season, and we don't want to count those guys out. So um, to answer your question, yeah, I think there's a possibility that someone just scores points in Supercross or motocross, but still makes it into the playoffs. So just judging by what you said there, um, I'm going to take a page out of maybe kind of like NASCAR's playoff book in a way. Um, it isn't going to be a hard reset once we reach super motocross. It sounds like what you said is that your results up until that point do matter in some way, whether it's like NASCAR where wins start you into the playoffs with a certain amount of points per win or something of that nature. So what you're saying is it's not going to be a complete hard reset. The riders that do both series and have certain points and wins will be rewarded in some way going into this playoff championship. Correct. Oh, again, still working through the details, but there'll be a seating. So when you go into the playoffs, you'll be seated at a certain level. Um, and we're working through those details with the OEMs. And we wanna make sure that everyone's included. Um, the OEMs, our sanctioning bodies, obviously AMA and AMA Pro. Um, so we're, we're gonna make sure everyone's um, heard and that we make the best decision for the overall sport. Very cool. Um, as of right now, uh, being with this big news drop, and of course you guys have stuff to work through, um, each respective series. So question for both of you is about how far out are we on, on getting to see this complete schedule, would you say for each of you? And then maybe the, the, the big one at the end. October. October. Okay. Yeah. That's the goal is all of it in October. So yeah, the combined. Oh, all of it. So all, once again, continuing on this co-working, it's, no longer to quite be, hey, here's the Supercross schedulers out. You guys are going to roll this out a lot more of a, a collective group. Definitely. Definitely. Um, jumping back a little bit to the TV side, something I never thought of is uh, I know modern day um, landscape, it, it's getting harder and harder to get TV slots for for sports that have, that exists a long time. You know, network programs that take three or four hours. Um, I read different articles and just notes about, you know, retention rates certain things um, being harder for network TV. So initially I was kind of curious how it is for you guys trying to pitch both series together. But from what you said earlier, it hasn't been a detriment in any way. It's actually been very positive for you guys going up against your typical stick and ball sports because of season length. Is that because the network, the networks that you're talking to, is it a marketing thing where they feel better about marketing you guys eight, nine months, like they're getting a better return or, or what's really the pop been the positive spin for you guys in pitching a longer um, combined presence. It's about content and having a longer season and it, and it's all about content and we didn't have enough. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, and you know, to Carrie's point, it's content and it's, our demo is extremely young. And right now the media landscape is kind of in this transitional um, area where linear and streaming, there's this, you know, I don't even, I don't think the media companies know where it's heading, but um, our demo are early adopters of streaming. Yet we all still um, feel like linear television is obviously really important. So um, for a media company, the fact that they can get, the nine, 10 months of content and it's, and it's one collective storyline. Yes. We're going to still keep the integrity of both championships. So there'll be, there'll be a super cross champion. There'll be a pro motocross champion, but we can interweave those storylines through the entire nine months and then into the playoffs. And I think media companies um, appreciate that. And, you know, our fans being so young, um, I think, a few, I don't know if it's a media term, but it, they're, they're sticky. Um, they watch, they'll watch a three hour broadcast or they'll watch a four hour broadcast where a lot of stick and ball sports, they're in and out. Um, but our fans are passionate and, and they're locked in. So that's, that's obviously attractive to media companies. 
Um, I guess I have two two last ones in this out with. They're a little bit tougher questions. They're from some of our, our viewers on our site. Um, I've seen a few comments about the, the $10 million purse. Again, people can be, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but they, they're, you know, people are just wondering where this has come from. Uh, again, uh, whether it be reactionary or certain things, people are wondering like why this hasn't been in the sport before, where all of a sudden it, it, the ability to put this purse in has came from. For you guys, has it just been an investment on on you guys as partners part? Is it because of the going to the playoff system? Is it the interest from partners in the series that there's enough new incoming that it's worth being able to put this up for you guys? Or It's a result of our combined media rights package. The only way that mm -hmm. we could um, do this, a purse of this magnitude was by working together on media rights. It's, it's, that's it. I mean, Kenneth Feld, our owner said it during one of our first meetings, but it's exponential and it's truly proven to be um, across the board media rights, as Carrie said, but, you know, just in general, the response from the industry, I think has been exponential to what it would have been if MX sports would have come out and said, we're doing this or Feld entertainment Feld motorsports came out and said, we're doing this. So um, that's really it is is the combined um, resources and and sport it was the combined bargaining power <laughs> we wouldn't have been able neither one of us could do this alone could could use that kind of purse yeah so the combined bargaining power and then the combined assets it's just it's at the end of the day it's a product that is worth more to the people that you were working with on the broadcasting side to sponsors everything it's your guys's combined effort is worth more on paper basically from everybody that's involved mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. um the other question is about the the world so the super motocross world championship term so of course this again last year with um with supercross dropping off um deciding not to renew with um fim and taking on the AMA pro racing side. Um, the fact that the series even for the last couple of years hasn't gone outside the U S so is the term, is the world tag just more of a naming rights thing? Is there potential goals down the road to actually do races outside the U S or is it just all in naming? It's just due to the fact that we have the best riders in the world competing at these two championships. We've got, I mean, look, we got Jet Lawrence from Australia, Joe Shimoda, Japan, Ken rocks in Germany. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So, that's truly what it is. It is, it's the fact that the best riders in the world race Monster Energy AMA Supercross and Lucas Oil Pro Motocross. And so that, that was the tag and uh, it only made sense to, to be the world championship. Actually, I do have a uh, one last question if you guys don't mind. It's about the, uh, the playoff into the championship is tracks. Um, is it going to be somewhat similar to a monster cup situation of a hybrid? Could it be really different between the three venues? Have you guys kind of locked down what we're actually going to see at these three races? What, what, the, what the track and what the direction of that's going to be? We're still working through it. Um, I think, you know, again, it goes back to what the theme seems to be of today, but we want to collectively work with the OEMs the athletes, the sanctioning bodies, just to make sure that we're producing the best racetrack that we can. But we definitely want them to be distinct. We want them to be unique. Um, and we want them to be in distinct and unique oh. venues. Um, obviously, motocross is impossible to hold within a stadium. So we're going to have larger venues, whether it's speedways or, you know, different types of outdoor venues. Uh, where we can build these unique racetracks. But uh, still working through it, but we just, again, it goes back to the industry coming together and making this as best as it could be. So uh, we're, we'll hope to uh, unveil those later on this fall. Fantastic. Thank you both for your time and answering all of our questions. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing the rest of the news. So again, for anybody who Cheers to cap it off. Sounds like you guys will have everything kind of coming from here on out will be from a shared voice. We should hear kind of everything in combined um, press releases. So it won't leak out slowly. We should see them in nice big chunks and get a lot of information about what's happening. You can show them that we're at Loretta's <laughs> and uh, we're in the middle of our team manager meeting. Say hi to Michael, everybody. Incomplete transparency. Yeah. <laughs> 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 nice.